I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about um, how the role of personal reputation is being transformed in the digital 21st century and why it's going to become a currency, a cornerstone of our society and our economy in the next decade. Um, before I sort of zoom in on the subject of personal reputation, um, I just want to give you a little bit of a, a macro picture on disruption to the financial world because this really explains where reputation capital fits in. So one of the areas that I've been looking at in my next book is something I call the great power shift. And we've heard a lot about this this morning, but if we look all around us across sectors, not just in banking, but education, healthcare, and so on, there's this massive shift happening around power and trust. And what I've spent the last year doing is really trying to understand why this shift is taking place. Now, I like to make very complex things simple. And basically, what I've seen is, if you think about it, in the 20th century, we built institutions, whether they were universities or big pharma or big banks, that basically centralized wealth control and production. And we did that for a very logical reason. We did that for scale, efficiency, and infrastructure. And then we developed systems such as credit ratings to fuel this system. Now, this was an era, this was a 20th century era that was largely built on institutional trust. And this is the disruption that's happening. If we look all around us, power is moving from the center to the niches, to the edges, to the networks, back to individuals. And this is a new era that's built on peer trust. Now, what I've seen is that this peer trust happens when four key drivers of disruption exist. And I was so relieved, actually, to hear from all the entrepreneurs this morning, because sometimes when you're working on a new idea, you start to wonder if you're imagining these things. But these became very apparent. So the four key things that I've seen um, often exist. Um, the first one is trust, so that trust in big or trust in the existing institution is broken. The second is when something is unnecessarily complex. So whether that's complex user experience, complex because of regulation. Um, someone mentioned the insurance industry this morning. There is, by the way, already a peer-to-peer -peer insurance disruptor. It's called Friend Insurance in Germany, and it's starting to do phenomenally well. Um, the third is when there are redundant intermediaries. Now, redundant intermediaries can literally be people, um, so lots of bank managers, or it can be fees, like credit card processing. Um, and the last is limited access. So by limited access, I, in the context of banking, you can think of underbank populations, people who don't have credit ratings. Now, if you think of the financial world, check, 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 check against all these four drivers, which is why I believe it's one of the sectors that's getting disrupted so fast. Now, what we've basically covered this morning is sort of the first three waves of this disruption. And these startups are very powerful, but they really are the first wave. So we've seen peer-to-peer -peer lending, whether that's TransferWise or Zopa. Um, we've seen payments, um, so whether that's new kinds of payments like Bitcoins or new ways of accepting payments like iZettle. And then we've seen new models of funding through the crowd. Now, I want to talk about sort of the fourth area here um, around a concept that I call reputation capital. Now, just to sort of diffuse up front um, what I am not talking about, because I often get asked this question. I am not talking about social media aggregators. Um, so I'm not talking about the likes of peer index or clout or cred. Um, these aggregators are taking social media data, so likes and followers, to basically measure reach and influence. They are not measuring how trustworthy we are. So they're not actually measuring reputation. So we're going to take a um, sort of little bit of a different look on online data. Now, I'm the first one to say that um, reputation is a very strange subject. Um, I kind of went into this topic thinking that it was going to be quite an easy world to navigate. And one of the first things that I found really interesting is that you've, if I ask most people in this room, um, do you think that personal reputation is important? 
I think many of you would answer yes. It helps you get a job. Um, it helps you with your relationships and so forth and so on. But if you ask people to define what personal reputation actually is, it's incredibly difficult. And I've actually looked at sort of literature and quotes throughout time, and they vary. So um, Abraham Lincoln described it like our shadow. And my favorite is Jeff Bezos here, who recently said, it's what people say about you when you leave the room. Now, you'll notice from these definitions that they're largely describing personal reputation as something very intangible. And that's very different from paper money. So if you think about paper money, I can hold it in my hands. And it has an agreed value amongst us. But personal reputation, to this point in time, has largely been controlled in the minds of other people. And it's largely been controlled in a way that it's been very difficult to sort of extract that information, manage it, build it, and utilize it in new kinds of ways. That's what's changing really, really fast. So all around us, we're leaving these trails of reputation data, how knowledgeable we are, how reliable we are, how clean we are. And what we're starting to figure out is how we can aggregate that reputation data and use it in really interesting ways. Now, I first came interested in this subject um, because of my work in collaborative consumption, which is also known as the sharing economy. And basically, I realized through looking at thousands of these marketplaces, they essentially had two key friction points. The first is payments, which we've talked about a lot this morning, and the second was trust between strangers. So if you look at many of these traditional mechanisms like credit ratings, they're not very helpful when you're deciding to rent out your car to someone or whether you should rent out your home on Airbnb. So the new kind of social glue that existed in this economy was trust. So let me just quickly give you a couple of examples. Um, I know Lyft was briefly mentioned this morning. How many of you are aware of Lyft? Like really know what it is? Okay, how many of you use Lyft in the United States? Okay, a couple of you. So the easiest way to think about Lyft is kind of like Uber um, meets blah blah car. So it's on demand ride sharing. So basically what happens is when you need a lift in the United States, it's now in five cities, um, you, you open your Lyft app, you can see all the drivers that are near to you and then basically you select the driver um, based on their online reputation profile, so you can see all their ratings and the transactions all completed online. Now, Lyft is a, a very hot startup right now. It just received $60 million in funding from um, Anderson and Horowitz, and it's based on the fact that within six months, they're actually doing 30,000 rides every single week. Now, the interesting thing about Lyft is that they were um, tried to be shut down recently by the California Public Utilities Commission. And one of the most powerful things they had and they took into court was their reputation data. Because on Lyft, the passengers rate the drivers and the drivers rate the um, passengers. And basically, the case was brought to them by the um, Taxi and Limousine Commission that were claiming that this marketplace was unsafe. But they could actually use this data to quantifiably prove that Lyft is actually a safer marketplace than traditional taxi or limousine operators. Now, Lyft is such an ex interesting example of what's happening here. Um, this is the two-way rating system. Um, because this wave of reputation is people often talk about eBay quite a bit. But this is the next wave on. Because if you think about on eBay, you really could be anonymous. You could have a pseudonym like Haunted Pirate. But in marketplaces like Lyft, we're basically using the internet to get off the internet. So we're using online tools to build face-to-face -to -face trust. And I think this is one of the most exciting next waves of the social graph. So how can we actually use all these kinds of social data to create new forms of trust that actually then completely implode the way we think about marketplaces? Now, undisputably, the sort of startup that has proved how successful this can be is Airbnb. Now, I'm not going to talk about Airbnb for very long because I'm sure you're all familiar with them, um, which is a very different situation even from a couple of years ago. But this marketplace that matches people who have place to rent with people who are looking for a place to stay, their growth is truly phenomenal. So 10 million nights have been booked. Um, there were 3 million guests who traveled on Airbnb last year alone. 
Now, I've spoken to lots of Airbnb hosts and guests and become sort of kind of a geek on their reputation system. And the most important thing that Airbnb has done for the collaborative consumption space is really proven how you can build trust, how you can use reputation systems. And basically what I've seen is that there are four actually very distinct phases that hosts and guests go through to build trust with one another. So the first phase um, that we spoke a little bit about this morning is verification. So is your online identity really who you are? The second phase is social connections. So if you look at 80% of successful peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, they're all integrated with Facebook Connect for the very reason that I can see if someone knows um, a host or has stayed at a place. The third is interests and values. So this is basically, do you have a dog? I have a dog. Did you go to the same university or the same company? Um, so you start to aggregate what values and interests people have that are similar to your own. And the last is actually ratings and reviews. So whether that's quantitative ratings through things like stars or whether that's the qualitative reviews. Now, Airbnb is actually one of the most sophisticated reputation systems because it enables you to take all these pieces of data and to say, can I trust this person? And it's a brilliant example of how in a marketplace that really depends on trust, it needs a measure. And the measure of trust is reputation. So my simple definition of reputation is it's basically the sum of what an individual or community thinks of you. And through this sum, we can actually start to make value judgments around complete strangers, around interactions. So I basically, um, as I started to dive deeper, be deeper, became really less interested in the reputation systems themselves, um, but more interested in sort of two dynamics. The first was the real value of reputation within these marketplaces. And the second was the value of the reputation data beyond these marketplaces. So if we look at it within the marketplaces first, this didn't surprise me, this is what I expected. So as people's reputation goes up on these marketplaces, so as they become Uber hosts and they become super task rabbits and they become super drivers on Lyft, their frequency of business and the amount they can charge increases. So, and this, excuse me, this varies from 2% to 35% depending on the maturity of the marketplace. Now, this is kind of what you'd expect. This is what they saw on eBay and that power sellers can charge a premium. The second thing that I saw, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, but that I also expected, was that that first rating or review is the key friction point for a lot of these marketplaces. So when they're onboarding lots of users, they essentially have like ghosts in the system until they have a rating or review, it's very difficult for them to get some kind of booking. And that's really the power of social connections. So what social connections enables people to do is get a really good sense of who that person is without having any activity within the marketplace. But it was really the third area that started to get interesting to me, which is when it all goes wrong. Now, what I mean when it all goes wrong is when someone's reputation is unfairly damaged. What's the role of the company? What does the user do? So I'll give you a perfect example. Um, a friend of mine, she is an Airbnb host, and she uses her Airbnb income to offset her mortgage on her flat. So she owns two flats, and one flat, she pays off the mortgage through her Airbnb income. This is actually a very common situation. She's hosted over 100 guests, and she had one guest who came to stay who saw a cockroach in the kitchen. Now, I live in Sydney. Cockroaches are not a sign that you are dirty or your place is dirty. We live in a humid climate. Now, this user wrote the most scathing review that it was basically a scummy place, you should never stay here, and she saw a massive drop in her bookings. And then she couldn't afford to pay her mortgage payments because she depends on this income. Her reputation profile is so valuable to her on eBay. So she contacted, sorry, on Airbnb, she contacted Airbnb and said, this, you know, you have to help me sort this situation out. It's really interfering with my bookings. And they said, well, did the guests see a cockroach? And she said, well, yes. And then they said, well, they could argue that it's an accurate reflection of the situation. So 
this is where reputation gets really interesting because the data makes us actually incredibly vulnerable. And this is why we're actually only at day one in terms of companies really thinking about their role in reputation-driven peer-to-peer marketplaces. So when should they intervene? How do they prevent positive bias? So when people are just paid, um, pasting positive reviews so that they get positive reviews in return. So there aren't answers to these questions yet, but I actually think that's what makes it really interesting, that we should be studying more what happens when reputation goes wrong versus when reputation goes right. The other thing that I discovered that was um, really interesting was how users were starting to use reputation beyond the marketplace that it was created. So let me just introduce you to another Airbnb host. Um, this is Kate Kendall. She's been a host on Airbnb since 2007. And Kate faced a common problem, that she moved to New York City, and she'd never lived in the United States before, and she couldn't get a place to rent. She couldn't get a mobile phone plan because she didn't have a credit history. So she started to think about, I'm essentially locked out the system because this phenomenal credit that I have built over 35 years is locked into one country. It's not portable. So she kind of did this as an experiment. She said, how can I, where is my most powerful data about me as a human being? And she realized it was on Airbnb. So she tried to get a mobile phone plan, was rejected. Um, she tried to get a loan from a bank, she was rejected, but she did get a lease. She took it into a property company and they said, my God, you've got 26 pages of reviews. We're not even gonna bother um, wasting the printer ink. And I thought this was really amazing. Like this is what she tweeted out. And this really is the future. This is people realizing that their reputation data has tremendous value, has the value to help them get a job, help them get a loan, help them get a lease, help them get a mortgage. Now, what we're starting to see is that companies and sectors are realizing that this data has tremendous value. And it works particularly well in banking. Now, the reason it works particularly well in banking is it's in sectors where information on people is highly fragmented, so it lists in lots of different sources, or when you're trying to use past behavior as a predictor of how someone um, will behave in the future. So in banking, how will their past behavior actually be an indicator of their propensity to pay in the future? Now, I think credit ratings are really interesting. So, you know, you probably are familiar with the fact that a third of all people only know what their credit rating stands for, which kind of seems crazy when it's such a determining factor on so many different parts of our lives. And if you think about credit ratings and the way they work, they're very bad at understanding context, cause, and character. So I was once late playing my mobile phone plan because I was away for two, um, two months and I never got the mail. Now, it affected my credit rating. It didn't understand the context, it didn't understand the cause, it didn't understand the character. Reputation data is the complete opposite of that. It gives a very good and accurate reflection of who someone really is. So we're already starting to see waves of startups, people like Lendo and Move On Bank and Credit Edge and um, Signify that are going into areas where people don't have traditional credit histories or where they have very poor credit histories but for some kind of good reason. And we're already starting to see how they're using social media data to extend loans to people. The next wave is how we actually start to use reputational data to extend loans to people that have been previously cut out of the system. Now, the last sort of thing that I want to talk about is reputation aggregation. Now, I actually debated, should I include this or should I exclude this? Um, because so far, um, reputation aggregators have failed. And basically, they have failed because I believe they're too early. But I've also seen um, them making sort of three common mistakes. So reputation aggregators are people that are basically trying to take reputation data from eBay, from TaskRabbit, from Lyft, um, from Airbnb, and aggregate it into one place. 
And the reason why that I've seen them fail is basically they've gone after the big players first. So they've approached Airbnb, they've approached um, people like eBay and said, open your reputation vault, this is for the benefit of the space. So they haven't really thought about the incentive, what's the key friction point for these massive players that reputation aggregation can actually open, help them overcome. The second thing that they're doing wrong is that they haven't really thought about how reputation aggregation can help beyond peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. So you can see, this is just a mock-up I created, but if you have a partnership with, say, a mortgage company or an insurance company, and you could start to actually use this data to affect your insurance premiums, that's where reputation aggregation gets really interesting. And the third thing they're doing is actually going back and making the same mistake as credit ratings. So they're reducing people to a number. So they're losing the behavior and the context that this information was created in. So we are only in day one of the reputation economy. And undisputably, the road ahead is going to be really messy. And one of the things that I'm very concerned about is how do we protect our data? How do we prevent privacy violations and lean this into an economy that is actually about individual empowerment? But ultimately, I believe the reputation economy will be a good thing. And the reason why I believe it will be a good thing is because it's going to create accountability and transparency in ways that we can't even imagine. I mean, imagine when we have a reputation system that um, sort of assesses all real estate agents. We'll never have to deal with a shoddy real estate agent again. Um, it will shift who has power. So you'll start to see people with the strongest reputations having more power, having more influence, having more say. And to me, one of the most important things it can actually help us do is take our economy that's largely being built on faceless transactions and move us towards an age that's built on humanness, a humanness in marketplaces that we lost, particularly in the financial world. So in an economy, in an environment that is full of uncertainty, is full of broken trust and Ponzi schemes, I actually think it's very empowering to think that what our old villagers taught us to be true is that how we treat people and how we behave will ultimately drive our worth. Thank you very much. <laughs> So who do you think is best placed, Rachel, to dominate this field? Who is going to be the Experian of personal reputation? Is it going to be a big institution that we have now, maybe government connected, or is it going to be a nimble startup that has an algorithm that can connect people in a way they accept? I think it's going to be a nimble startup within a large infrastructure or network. So um, Facebook actually recently acquired Legit which is one of these first reputation aggregators, and they're giving them quite a lot of freedom um, and um, saying, like, what can we actually do with the network? Final question. Um, when you wrote What's Mine Is Yours and started people thinking about the sharing economy, collaborative consumption, um, a lot of the companies you wrote about had not had that much mainstream exposure. Since then, Many of them have had tens of millions of dollars of investment. Um, Airbnb is you know, a vast, multi-billion corporation now. How far more do you see this economy going before it runs out of steam? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a good question because investors are always saying, where should we invest next? And someone actually said to me, is tie swapping a good marketplace? And I said, no, I, I don't think that's a great idea. So um, I think... One of the things that we're going to see is a lot more um, innovation at the city level. So I actually think we'll see more venture funds and investment funds thinking about shareable infrastructure. Um, I still think there's a massive play in enterprise and B2B, so thinking more about utilities and um, um, things like liquid space, sharing of office space, that's going to be really interesting. And then I think you're going to see an interesting sort of aggregation and monopolies of the existing players. So um, I think many of the obvious verticals have been taken for investment, and I, uh, it's actually amazing that many of these ideas that I was talking about even three years ago and people laughed, um, they're now getting $60 million, so, which is why I say to the reputation aggregators, it's, it, it may seem early, but it's actually a really short space of time when you're thinking about three years that can make a difference. They're now rating each other's laughs. They are. Rachel, <laughs> we look forward to the book. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Rachel Thank Botsman. Thank you very much. <laughs>